starting this video, I'm first going to describe the entity that we are dealing with. <clears throat> it is a being that is essentially worshipped or revered, adhered to, by a select cult, if you will, of their followers. <clears throat> this entity or being takes many forms and is most readily apparent in the juridical entities of today which make up its body or corporation, as in they are incorporated into the body of this entity or being. It is essentially called many different things. And in this video, we are going to look at examples of its various uh, components. Just as a body has a component of a mouth, eyes, arms, legs, and torso, etc. So this entity has those things as well, but they're not in the same general sense that we might understand it. And this is the being that is worshipped by the cult, the alleged ruling cult of today that many refer to as the Cabal, but has many other names in many forms, and they are the following followers of this being an entity which they seek to essentially bring life to. So our first example comes from this particularly uh, atrocious work made by one of their followers called the Laws of Imitation by Gabriel Tard, professor of the College de France, member of the Institute. They couldn't just have said the College of France or anything like that, or perhaps the university as we use today. Anyway, translated from the second French edition by L.C. Clues Parsons, lecturer on sociology in Bernard College, with an introduction by Franklin H. Giddings, professor of sociology in Columbia University, New York, Henry Holt Company, 1903. And of course, they all like to work together to uh, give themselves the appearance of credentials or authorship, make themselves look, quote unquote, legitimate. In the part termed, what is society, which is in chapter three, it states, what is a society? The general answer is as follows. It is a group of distinct individuals to render one another mutual services, but this definition is as false as it is clear. Yes. So then why would you select that as the quote-unquote general answer? And then not to mention, from whom is that the general answer? But that's not really that relevant here. It has been the source of all these confusions, or those confusions, which have so often been made between so-called animal societies, or the majority of them, and the only true societies which do include, in a certain connection, a small number of animals. For this wholly economic notion, a notion which bases the social group upon mutual helpfulness, it might be an advantage to substitute a purely juristic concept of society. We're talking about juridic entities here, or as we would know them, corporations. In this case, an individual will not be associated with those to whom he was useful or who were useful to him, but with those, and only with those, who had established over him recognized rights of law, custom, and convention, or over when he had analogous rights with or without reciprocity. That's a description of exactly what we live, the world we live in today, and it is affected or made on purpose. It is essentially the idea of a supreme and powerful being that presides over us and us being the slaves to it. That is the God, and in this context, God has multiple meanings, being a old use of the word good. So in many cases, they are fake good, as in fake nice, pretending to be. And also in the other term of the use, a fake overarching deity or being that rules over us, which they comprise, of course, and in fact, is anything but. In the Cardinal Principles of Secondary Education Bulletin 1918, number 35, Department of the Interior Bureau of Education, report of the Commission on the Reorganization of Secondary Education appointed by the National Education Association, we will get a look at, or further look at this concept and how it would have been worded in the past. And again, you see that general example of them adding titles and different groups, which they all control to create the presentation of multiple entities all working together. All of those entities, of course, being incorporated into the body of this being. 
you know, on Friedrich Nietzsche, one of their apparent followers, but that's still up for debate, called the super being or over being, overseer, however you would wish to call it, which of course contains the all seeing eye. Under two, the goal of education and democracy, it defines or provides a definition of democracy, which of course is not the same definition that many other people might have. It states the purpose of democracy is so to organize society that each member may develop his personality primarily through activities designed for the well-being of his fellow members and of society as a whole, as in a whole being, a holistic entity, a singular body, right? Nyarlathotep, if that's how you say it, by H.P. Lovecraft, uh, or at least attributed to that name, which is a published name in which works made by different writers are published under the single name. And of course, this uh, name, because it is just a name, has a whole backstory and all kinds of other stuff that they have manifested. Anyway, this story essentially describes things that seem eerily similar today and essentially talks about this sort of super supreme being which is made over us by its followers essentially that cult of conjurers seeking to bring forth this abomination now lathotep the crawling chaos i am the last i will tell the audience void i do not recall distinctly when it began but it was months ago the general tension was horrible to a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger. A danger widespread and all-embracing, such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces, and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land, and out of the abysses, between the stars swept chill currents that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demoniac alteration in the sequence of the season. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world, and perhaps the universe, had passed from the control of known gods or forces, that of gods or forces which were unknown. And it was then that Nyarlathotep came out of Egypt. Who he was, none could tell, but he was of the old native blood and looked like a pharaoh. The fellahin knelt when they saw him, yet could not say why. He said he had risen up out of the darkness or blackness of 27 centuries, and that he had heard messages from places not on this planet. Into the lands of civilization came Nyarlathotep, swarthy, slender, and sinister, always buying strange instruments of glass and metal and combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of the sciences of electricity and psychology and gave exhibitions of power which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which swelled his fame to exceeding magnitude. Men advised one another to see Nyarlathotep and shuddered, and where Nyarlathotep went, rest vanished, for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. Never before had the screams of nightmare been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wish they could forbid sleep in the small hours that the shrieks of cities might less horribly disturb the pale, pitying moon as it glimmered on green waters gliding under bridges and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. I remember when Nyarlathotep came to my city, the great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelations, and I burned with eagerness to explore his utmost mysteries. My friend said they were horrible and oppressive beyond my most fevered imaginations. That was thrown on a screen in the darkened room prophesied things none but Nyarlathotep dared prophesy, and that in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which showed only in the eyes. And I heard it hinted abroad that those who knew Nyarlathotep looked on the sights which others saw not. It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with the restless crowds to see Nyarlathotep. Through the st stifling night and up the endless stairs into the choking room. And shadowed on a screen I saw hooded forms amidst ruins and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments. 
that I saw the world battling against blackness, against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling around the dimming a cooling sun. Then the sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators and stood up on end while shadows more grotesque than I can tell came out and squatted on the heads. And when I, who was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about imposture and static electricity, Nyarlathotep drove us all out. Down the dizzy stairs into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets, I screamed aloud and I was not afraid. That I never could be afraid, and others screamed with me for solace. We swear to one another that the city was exactly the same and still alive. And when the electric lights began to fade, we cursed the company over and over again and laughed at the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something coming down from the greenish moon, for when we began to depend on its light, we drifted into curious involuntary formations and seemed to know our destinations, though we dare not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement and found the blocks loose and displaced by grass, with a scarce line of rusted metal to show where the tram whales had run, and again we saw a tram car, alone, windowless, dilapidated, and almost on its side. When we gazed around the horizon, we could not find the third tower by the river and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was ragged at the top. Then we split up into narrow columns, each of which seemed drawn in a different direction. One disappeared in a narrow alley to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moan. Another filed down a weed-choked subway entrance, howling with a laughter that was mad. My own column was sucked toward the open country and presently felt a chill, which was not of the hot autumn, for as we stalked out into... On the dark moor, we beheld around us the hellish moon glitter of evil snows. Trackless, inexplicable snows swept asunder in one direction only, where lay a gulf at the all the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin indeed as it plodded dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind, for the black rift in the green litten snow was frightful, and I thought I had heard the reverberations of a disquieting wail as my companions vanished. But my power to linger was slight. As if beckoned by those who had gone before, I half floated between the titanic snowdrifts, quivering and afraid into the slightless vortex of the unimaginable. In the Game of Thrones series, uh, where the books seem to cut off, and I believe this is the reason why, it talks about the many-faced god. This many-faced god is found at a temple, an ancient temple, in an old city in which they practice specific techniques that relate to the dead. They keep for and care of the dead and take their faces, as you will see with serial killer tropes, where they wear the faces of their victims. And, of course, the character Arya Stark was directed to this place by an assassin that wore many faces, sensing, of course, her susceptibility to become a servant of the many-faced god. She takes on an assumed name and as part of her training to sell uh, oysters at the wharf. And she also, as far as the TV show goes, convinces a child to essentially commit suicide by drinking poisoned water, unbeknownst to the child, in order to make pain go away. And whether or not that pain was created by followers of the many-faced god is not actually described but is likely, considering the way this entity and their followers work. Now, this explanation seems like a original or origin story to the cult of alleged rulers that appear to run things today. This gives you a context for the term Facebook, given to a social media outlet which provides a sea of faces characters, backstories, and other information that can be adopted and taken by those individuals who live life under assumed names and assumed identities and is endlessly useful for those that follow such a being, an abhorrent entity that seeks to rule and eventually destroy all life. And the followers of that, the if you want to call them death cult, seek to bring about the rise of this abomination, which we see today in all of the corporations that are all controlled equally together and form the body of this 
beast. It also gives you another context to the Book of the Dead, that Egyptian book coming out of Egypt like Neralathotep, in which, more than likely, it is describing the raising of the dead entity or the dead corporations, the juridical creatures made by the followers of the sect of worshippers. Also, as the Book of the Dead correlates to that story about Neolithotep, the juridical entities brought us television screens and theaters, which are used as a means of mind control and programming through elements of hypnosis and other methods, which then correlate people into uh, program behavior, which we really saw vividly in 2020, which has a strong resemblance to the story of Neuralophotep, which seems more like something out of the Bible or the Book of Revelations. Speaking of the Book of Revelations, there's one particular section among many which they intentionally misconstrue so that we will not find what it truly means or what it's truly talking about. And they do this with everything. One of their tactics is to construe something that's figurative into literal or construe it into something else through depictions and other uh, techniques, which in fact references something different. Here, 13, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns were ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, they would depict that and then describe it as an actual creature like this, with actually seven heads and ten horns, like some sort of hydra or chimera or whatever. However, heads was a unit of measurement for height an old unit of measurement for height that many would probably not know unless they read old books about design and things like that. Horns were used as a measurement for weight, like a cornucopia or a drinking horn. I'm sure crowns had something to do with that, the same thing as well. And the having a name on a head sounds quite similar to, say, a slogan or possibly a comp corporation, name of a corporation. And this is described as a beast, but it could also be translated to a creature, like the creature of the Vatican or the creature of the Pope, which is the way that uh, a illustrious Roman lawyer, allegedly, termed it as far as the Vatican Bank goes. Now we come to a city called Baalbek. It states it's now, uh, according to worldhistory.org, now a modern day Lebanon north of Beirut in the Beka Valley, inhabited as early as 9000 BCE, whatever the hell that means. Baalbek grew into an important pilgrimage site in the ancient world for the worship of the sky god Baal and his consort Astarte, the queen of heaven in Phoenician religion. The name Baalbek means Lord, Ball of the Becca Valley. The center of the city was a grand temple dedicated to Astarte and Baal, and the ruins of this early temple remain today beneath the later Roman Temple of Jupiter. Baal, Baalbek is listed by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. All right, so now we've established that they do all of this trickery with language and line, and allegedly Baal is the word for master in, uh, in Yiddish. However, this name is, seems to be a unification of two, including Baal and Sobek, the alleged uh, crocodile god of Egypt. Now, they represent, they misrepresent absolutely everything. They either take something that's figurative and turn it literal, or something that's literal and turn it figurative. Or they take something that's literal and means one thing, and then they make it literal to mean something else. They do all of these different games. All these followers of this supreme being entity do this stuff. I would suggest that Baal likely means good, just as God is an old use of the word good. 
Anyway, the Baalbek stones, the cornerstones of the earlier temple at Baalbek, have been found to weigh over 100 tons, and the remaining wall monoliths weigh each 300 tons, leaving present-day archaeologists, scientists, and historians mystified. Yeah, as always. There's always mystified, right? As Because they're mystifying things. Anyway, as to how the stones were moved, where from, and in what way they could have been manip manipulated in space, into place. These blocks and another one mile from Baalbek, much which weighs over 900 tons, are known today as the Baalbek stones and have been the subject of much debate, study, and conjecture over how they were moved and arranged. Further questions arise as to why such massive stones were necessary at the site and why the columns of the temple are also larger than they need to be. And, of course, the one question that they are never going to ask, and you're not allowed to ask either, according to them, is this seems fairly similar to other places all across the world that people have questions about. But the questions alone are enough to make you an opponent of the followers of this being entity, which is essentially the, as they would term it, master of lies or the lord of light or however many other ways you want to call it. Another area that you can figure out the, the sort of ancient pattern of, as far as we can tell anyway, because it might not be that old or ancient, but the language manipulation comes from the character AE. According to Wikipedia, AE is a character formed from the letters A and E, originally ligature, representing the Latin diphthong A. Of course, Latin, and I'll get to that in a little bit, appears to be, as far as evidence suggests, a constructed label and not an actual old language as we know language to be. And they take the singular character and then break it out and they call that Romanizing or Latinizing it or whatever. Anyway, it has been promoted the status of letter. Oh yeah, it's been promoted. But who promoted it, right? Who gets decree and now has the status of a letter? Anyway, in some languages, including Danish, Norwegian, Icelandic, and Faroese, or Faroese, it was also used in Old Swedish before being changed to A with two dots. Modern international phonetic alphabet uses it to represent the near open front unrounded vowel, the sound represented by the A in English, words like cat. Diacritic variants include, and there's all those, as a letter of the Old English Latin alphabet, it was called AESC, ash tree, after the Anglo-Saxon Futhark rune, which is transliterated. Its traditional name in English is, all, is still ash or ash, Old English ash, A-A-E-S-C. The so ligature is included. And as we've established before, all of their writings, of which pretty much everything were allowed since they have mostly control over access to information, is made by them with a design to mislead. So we come to the term Aether, or Ether. A-E-T-H-E-R, and here we see that character of the joined A-E. In Greek mythology, Aether, 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 or Ether, brightness, pronounced as the personification of the bright upper sky. According to Hesiod, he was a son of Erebus, darkness and Nyx, night, and the brother of Hemera, day. In Orphic cosmology, Aether was the offspring of Kronos, time, and the brother of Chaos, and Erebus. These sounds like, this sounds like they're taking words that mean something, and then extrapolating that and giving it all this different context and pretext that it did not have before originally, such as trying to say that people worship deity that they called night or darkness, when in fact those were simply just words describing that. And in the future, they will invent all sorts of pantheons, if they're still in existence, of course, about what we worship, saying that we had a a computer god. The com we worship the computer because we spent so much time at it, and it was a shrine and all this other crap. They already kind of do that with television today anyway, saying people worship at the altar of the television, which in some cases might be true. Then we have a Thellington, right? Athellington versus Ether is a small village and civil parish in the mid-Suffolk district of Suffolk. England, about 12 miles southeast from Dis. The name is derived from the Old English word aethling, 
population of the village was less than 50 at the 2011 census is included in the civil parish of Reddingfield. 2005, the population was estimated as 30. The village's name means farm settlement of the princes. The village is first recorded as Ellington in 942 in the wall of Bishop Theodred, granting lands to a community dedicated to St. Ethelbert, right? Like Ether, Ethelbert, probably. But you would say Athelington, so that's pretty interesting. In Hoxney, it was not recorded in the Doomsday Book of 1086. Uh, there are six listed buildings in the parish, with the Church of St. Peter being second listed, and the remaining five being grade two listed, including the 7th century Athelington Hall. And they do love their classifications and subclassifications and corralling everything into a nice, neat, orderly structure that they can control and change of course, all of this makes you wonder, or it makes me wonder, why the Eastern Roman Empire, alleged of Constantinople, Byzantium, the various different names, spoke Greek and not Latin, the alleged language of the so-called Roman Empire. Of course, there's other areas in which we find this, the mouthpiece of this being, this uh, abstract entity, that the uh, followers worship and seek to summon and conjure and put into reality. That's in the term pickle. Uh, according to Online Etymology Dictionary, it states C1400, spice sauce served with meat or fowl. Early 14th century is a surname, probably from Middle Dutch pekel, pickle brine, or related words of Low German and East Frisian, Dutch pekel, East Frisian pakel, and German pokel which are of uncertain origin or original meanings. Yeah, right. I'm sure that they have an original meaning and a certain origin, but to these people, they don't want you to know, so they state it's uncertain. That's one of their games they play. Klein suggests the name of medieval Dutch fishermen who developed the process. The meaning cucumber, preserved in pickle, first recorded in 1707 via use of the word for the salty liquid in which a meat, etc., was preserved. 1500. Colloquial figurative sense of a sorry plight, a state or condition of difficult or disorder, is recorded by 1560s. Yeah, that's probably not fabricated. From the time when the word still meant a sauce served on meat about to be eaten, meaning troublesome boy, is from 1788, perhaps from the notion of being imbued with roguery. So there's a lot of uncertainty. <laughs> and then there's a lot of certainty in this singular uh, explanation. So they have some uncertainty, a lot of certainty and stuff. And then, of course, remember that what their game and their objective is, is to confuse, obfuscate, mystify, and mislead. The Pico Hob or Pikelhaben, from German Pikel, point or pickaxe, and Hob, bonnet, a general word for headgear, also Pikelhelm, is a spike leather or metal helmet that was worn in the 19th and 20th centuries by Prussian and German soldiers of all ranks, firefighters, and police. Although it's typically associated with the Prussian army, which adopted in 1842-43, helmet was widely imitated by other armies during that period. It is still worn today as part ceremony well in the military of certain countries such as Sweden, Chile, and Colombia. There you see a example of the pickle hub, which is indeed a helmet or hat with a spike on the top. Next, the Wikipedia article, Pith. Pith or medulla is a tissue in the stems of vascular plants. Pith is composed of soft, spongy parenchyma cells, which in some cases can store starch. In Eudicotyledons. Couldn't make that word easy, right? Pith is located in the center of the stem in mono monocotyledons. It extends in only into roots. The pith is encircled by a ring of xylem. The xylem, in turn, is encircled by a ring of phloem. I'm not going to define those terms, I suppose. While new pith grows is usually white or pale in color, the tissue ages it commonly darkens to a deeper brown color. In trees, pith is generally present in young growth, but in the trunk and older branches, the pith often gets replaced in great part by xylem. In some plants, the pith in the middle of the stem may dry out and disintegrate, resulting in a hollow stem. A few plants, such as walnuts, have distinctive chambered pith with numerous short cavities. See the image at middle right. 
The cells in the peripheral parts of the pith may in some plants develop to be different from cells in the rest of the pith. This layer of cells is then called the paramodulary region of the pithymus. For an example of this can be observed in Hetera helix, a species of ivy. Now, of course, we can notice with all of these Wikipedia articles that they all share a general pattern to them. Some appear to either be written by some sort of university bimbo or professor who has spent their entire life behind the doors of an indoctrination machine, or by their students, who unknowingly are used as essentially slave and labor, unpaid and unrecognized, who provide all of this garbage that is then spewed throughout the internet and into the Wikipedia articles. The Pith Helmet also known as the Safari Helmet, Salicot, Solotopi, Sun Helmet, Topi, and Topi is a lightweight cloth cutter helmet made of shallow pith. The pith helmet originates from the Spanish military adaptation of the native Salicot headgear of the Philippines. It was often worn by European travelers and explorers in the varying climates found in Southeast Asia, Africa, and the tropics, but it was also used in many other contexts. It was routinely issued to colonial military personnel serving in warmer climates from the mid-19th to the mid-20th century. Headdress remains in use in several military services in the 21st century. Here we will notice that the pith helmet has that familiar crowned spike that you find in the pickle hob. Yet there is no reference to it, and there is no reference to the pickle hob, and in the pickle hob article there is no reference to the pith helmet. Go figure. Of course, when we take cucumbers and pickle them, we will then cut those pickles into different parts, and we will call them spears. Wasn't that interesting? Of course, the manipulation of the language for, by these followers of this cult, or, or the members of this cult, followers of the so-called supreme being, or the many-faced god, or nameless god, or whatever you want to call it, they are very well known in their various manipulations of the language among certain circles. And naturally, they have a long history and have invented their own language, allegedly, which, of course, they don't take credit for inventing Latin because that was, of course, around in ancient times where they didn't invent the language, they invented the label of Latin. Whereas, apparently, Esperanto is the world's most widely spoken, constructed international auxiliary language. Yeah, right. I bet Klingon is spoken more than this piece of garbage. Created by L.L. L. Zamenhof in 1887, it is intended to be a universal second language for international communication, or the international language. Maybe this is the language of that super bean that's used by all of its mouthpieces, which is the reason why they all sound uh, like automatons. Zamenhof first described the language in Dr. Esperanto's international language, Esperanto Unua Libro, which he published under the pseudonym Doctoro Esperanto. That sounds like a thesis that somebody wrote and was not actually made by a person with the intent of inventing a new language. So, who knows what happened there. Early adopters of the language liked the name Esperanto and soon used it to describe his language. The word Esperanto translates into English as one who floats. It wasn't that nice. Some further evidence of the uh, operations, if you want to call them that, of these followers of the cult of the super being of the juridical governor of the world can be found in resolution acts and orders of congress for the year 1780 volume six published by order of congress printed by john dunlap and i should point out first that this document is certainly forgery and was actually made at a much later date, pretending to be written by those original founders of the United States of America in 1780. The most obvious example that presents it as a forgery is this particular section, a proclamation for a fast. It having pleased the righteous governor of the world. Isn't that a very odd title? 
Anyway, for the punishment of our manifold offenses to permit the sword of war still to harass our country, it becomes us to endeavor by humbling ourselves before him and turning from every evil way to avert his anger and obtain his favor and blessing, and is thereby, therefore hereby recommended the several states. Now, Wednesday, the 26th day of April next, be set apart and observed as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer that we may with one heart heart and one voice implore the sovereign lord of heaven and earth to remember mercy in his judgment to make us sincerely penitent for our transgressions and prepare us for deliverance and to remove the evils with which he hath been pleased to visit us to banish vice and irrelegation or ir irreligion from among us and establish virtue and piety by his divine grace to bless all public councils throughout the United States, giving them wisdom, firmness, and unanimity, and directing them to the best measures of the public good, to bless the magistrates and people of every rank, and animate and unite the hearts of all to promote the interests of their country, to bless the public defense, inspiring all commanders and soldiers with magnanimity and perseverance in giving vigor and success to the military operations by sea and land to bless the illustrious sovereign and the nation in alliance with these states and all who interest themselves in support of our rights and liberties to make that alliance of perpetual and extensive usefulness to those immediately concerned and mankind in general to grant fruitful seasons and to bless our industry, trade, and manufacturers, to bless all schools and seminaries of learning and every means of instruction and education to cause wars to cease and to establish peace among the nation. And it's further recommended that all servile labor and recreations be forbidden on the said day. Now that was clearly written by a Jesuit because of the overly striking Catholic angle, which is definitely intended. And also, or at least somebody who is familiar and carries the moniker of a Jesuit, was also written at a much later date and was definitely not written in 1780. But most importantly, that, with another example, would, considering its strongly Catholic bend, would definitely alienate all the other religions which were involved in that colonial struggle and completely runs counter to the section in the Constitution stating that no religious oath will be required for taking offices. And they definitely would not have written something as inflammatory as that. That is clearly inflammatory from a particularly Roman Catholic perspective, specifically from the mouth of the Jesuits, the way that they will operate and work. This is definitely a forgery, and I don't believe, I do believe, actually, that it was supposed to be seen as a forgery at the time that I believe it was written for a particular motive to it. Anyway, let's go and look at the next example. Rules and Articles in General Congress of the United Colonies held at Philadelphia on the 10th day of May, 1775. Uh, this is uh, quite ridiculous garbage that they've made but it's intended for a very specific purpose and this one particularly references the armed forces article 2 it is earnestly recommended to all officers and soldiers diligently to attend divine service that all officers and soldiers who shall behave indecently or irreverently in any place of divine worship shall if commissioned officers be brought before a court-martial, there to be publicly and severely reprimanded by the president. If not commissioned officers or soldiers, every person so offending shall for his first offense forfeit one-sixth of a dollar to be deducted out of his next pay for the second offense. He shall not only forfeit a like sum, but be confined for 24 hours, and for every like offense shall suffer and pay in like manner, which money so forfeited shall be applied to the use of the sick soldiers of the troop or company to which the offender belongs. I highly doubt that they wrote that as Article 2 on rules and regulations for the, the armed forces. I, I, being in the middle of a war at the time, allegedly, they would not have put that as the second most important 
thing to be done in wartime. That is incredibly illogical, and it is clearly done as a out of a design to inflame the sentiments of the people at the time that it was made, stir them up essentially in quote unquote anti Catholic sentiment. Designed, done on purpose. These are forged, do forged documents from the founding period, and they are the followers of this cult, the, the members of this cult, the followers of the supreme entity as they term it, are very versed in forgeries. And generally speaking, when they do something like this, it is designed to be out in the open and done to incite uh, hatred and wrath. In their forged documents, of pretty much we only have forged documents from the time period because they won't allow the true things to be seen. And among all the different corroborating evidence and patterns we can divine or design <laughs> to use one of their stupid words, but divine actually means guess. We can be certain that these are forgeries. Anyway, you have the rights of Great Britain asserted against the claims of America being an answer to the Declaration of the General Congress. This one is particularly insulting and definitely was written at a later date. An answer to the Declaration of the General Congress. When independent states take up arms, they endeavor to impress the world with favorable favorable opinion of their own cause and to lay the blame of hostilities on the injustice of their opponents. But if nations accountable to none for their conduct deem it necessary to reconcile others to their proceedings, the necessity is still more urgent with regard to those who, breaking through every political duty, draw their swords against the state of which they own themselves the subjects. Right? Boom. The opinions of mankind are invariably opposed to such men. Their assertions are heard with distrust their arguments weighed. Uh, I'm not sure what that word is. And therefore, it is necessary for them to adhere to truth in the former and is prudent to avoid sophistry in the latter. This consideration, however obvious may appear to others, seems to have totally escaped the attention of the body of men who lately sat at Philadelphia under the name of the General American Congress in a paper published under the title of a declaration by the representatives of the United Colonies of North America. Hmm. The facts are either willfully or ignorantly misrepresented, and the arguments deduced from premises that have no foundation in truth. But as whatever falls for men who call themselves the representatives of a people must fall with some degree of weight on the minds of the undiscerning part of mankind, it becomes in some measure necessar necessary to examine briefly the reasons held forth by the Congress to justify the rebellion of their constituents. This does not sound like the way that they talked at the time, especially the use of the word constituent, despite their use of that stupid F, pretending to be an F. On a subject so trite, arguments advanced by other writers may sometimes recur. The novelty is less the object of this part of the disquisition than perspicuity and precision. And I should note here that in this one line, they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight instances of the use of F in the place of an S. That might have been a way that people wrote at the time, but they did not use it that many times in one sentence. That's one of those things when you look at it and you say, this writer is trying too hard to make it look like they're writing from the time period. The Declaration of the Congress, again, you've got the F and then an S, begins with an involved period which either contains no meaning or a meaning not founded in the principles principles of reason. They seem to insinuate that no body of men right, body of men is a not body of man, but body of men in an empire can exercise an unbounded authority over others, an opinion contrary to fact under every form of government. Well, every form of their governments and every their form of course being the form of that abomination, this supreme being. No maxim in policy is more universally admitted 
and that of a supreme and uncontrollable power must exist somewhere in every state. Don't you just love that? Dead giveaway right there. That one line. This is written by a follower of that cult and is a forgery. This ultimate power, though justly dreaded and reprobated in the person of one man, is the first spring in every political society. Now, of course, a lot of people would say that they're referring to the King of England. But, in fact, at the time, the colonists were contending against Parliament, not, technically speaking, the King. There were a lot of other things that went into this, which is completely obfuscated, trying to reduce it into subjects versus sovereign, which is not exactly the way it went. The great difference between the degrees of freedom in various governments consists merely in the manner of placing this necessary discre discretionary power. In the British Empire, it is vested where it is most safe in the king, lords, and commons under the collective appellation of the legislature. And here in this document, it references reprobated in the person of one man, and then right below it contradicts itself by saying that it is in fact vested in a group of men. So which is this one man they're talking about? It's not the king. That's for sure. Legislature is another name for the constitution of the state. And in fact, the state itself. The Americans still own themselves the subjects of the state. That does not, that phrase, that line right there is so clearly something recently, relatively recently made. That, they did not talk like that. But if they refuse obedience to the laws of the legislature, they play upon words and are no longer subjects but rebels. In vain, they have affirmed that they are the subjects of the king's prerogative. Yeah. That's a word that a lot of lawyers use today. And it might have been in use then, but it was not use in general parlance, as it would be. Anyway, and not his subjects in his legislative quality, as a king with regard to his subjects in general, is to be considered only in his executive capacity as a great hereditary magistrate who carries into effect the laws of the legislature. The only, only discretionary and uncontrollable power in a free state. Isn't that nice? There's your worship of the supreme being. The discretionary and uncontrollable authority of the British legislature being granted their right to tax all subjects of the British Empire can never be denied. And here we get into this talking point that you hear repeated today to no end, the dead horse being beaten constantly. Mm -hmm. The taxation without represent, re representation. The colonists did not fight over taxation without representation. They fought over Many, many, many other things which are conveniently glossed over and summed down into this singular talking point, which makes them seem like a whole bunch of morons. Some ill-informed reasoners in politics have lately started an obsolete maxim, which has been seized with avidity by the Americans, that the supreme can power cannot take from any one, any part of his property without his consent, or in other words, that representation is inseparable from taxation. That is not what they were going with. They had, that had to do with the fact that they were not the, they were not being treated properly according to the laws of England. Had absolutely nothing to do with this talking point. This is an example of the tactics of these followers, the mouthpiece of the Supreme Being, where they will say that you're stating something, completely obfuscating and misconstruing what you actually said, what some people might refer to as gaslighting. And then they will take this fiction that they've made about you, and they'll run with it and create all sort of extrapolated stories and frauds and falsehoods in an attempt to essentially persecute you or prosecute you for their invention of what you said. And we see it all the time with the so-called lawyers or attorneys of today twisting words and putting words in your mouth, but this is done throughout the body, the mouthpiece part of the body anyway, of the followers of this supreme being. The colonists say they have no representatives in Parliament, and therefore Parliament has no right to tax the colonists. That's 
not what happened. And a good example of what really happened as far as logically speaking it goes can be found in the Trade and Empire book, which I've covered in other videos. Upon this principle, scarce one in 25 of the people of Great Britain is represented. Out of more than 7 million, fewer than 300,000 have an exclusive right to choose. Here they have written, written choose as C-H-U-F-E. Isn't that nice? Members of Parliament. And therefore, more than three times the number of the Americans have an equal right with them to dispute the authority of the legislature to subject them to taxes. The truth is, representation never accompanied taxation in any state. The Romans were a free nation, yet the Senate, that is the great body of the nobility, possessed the sole right to tax the people. Boy, they use the word taxation a lot here. Most of it was called, at the time, revenue. The people who went to collect the king's revenue were revenue agents, and we have the Internal Revenue Service. This term of taxation, that's not right. Anyway, in this kingdom. The house. Now, even in their forgeries, they have a problem with congruency and conflicting things that they write about, which then conflicts with other things they write about, putting both things into uh, question, right? If you have one thing that states the 13 colonies, and then you have another that states an address of the 12 United Colonies of North America by the representatives of Congress of the people of Ireland, well, both documents would be called somebody's line, obviously. Or how about both of them are? This particular document, which I'm not going to read because it's purely a waste of time, essentially reduces the people of the Americas, specifically, of course, the uh, people of uh, the alleged original 13 colonies, into groveling wimps, of which they definitely weren't, weren't, making them sound like they're absolutely pleading on their knees to Ireland, which is just ridiculous as a notion. I mean, somebody who decides to go to war against England or Great Britain, as it should be, the United Great British Empire, uh, over all these things that they had going, would not then go around groveling. It's just ridiculous. So these documents, at least with the most obvious of Ca Irish Catholic uh, Jesuit bend to it, that sort of pattern of speech that they use, the bishops and all of the different higher-up titular individuals, not, of course, some of the excommunicated, according to the Pope, uh, Catholics or the other people who practice the Catholic faith. Well, those documents, those four documents, were specifically intended to inflame quote-unquote anti-Catholic sentiment, and here we can find evidence of that, uh, even throughout their own fraudulent work. According to Wikipedia, the Ursuline Convent Riots occurred August 11th and 12th, 1834, in Charlestown, Massachusetts, near Boston. In what is now Somerville, Massachusetts, during the riot, a convent of Roman Catholic Ursuline nuns was burned down by a Protestant mob. And, of course, the twist here is that those abolitionist Protestants all referenced the society, meaning they were Jesuits. Isn't that interesting? Jesuits, pretending to be Protestants, go around and incite violence among the Protestants against the Catholics. Hmm. Haven't seen that one before. The event was triggered by reported abuse of a member of the order and was fueled by the rebirth of extreme anti-Catholic sentiment in antebellum New England. They do love their labels, don't they? From the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, literal tolerance was exhibited by the Puritan leadership even toward Protestant views that did not accord with heirs. The province of Massachusetts base was established in 1692. Its charter protected freedom of worship for Protestants in general, but specifically excluded Roman Catholics. Somehow, I don't believe that. After American independence, there was a broadening of tolerance in the nation, but this tolerance did not particularly take hold in Massachusetts. The arrival of many Catholic Irish immigrants ignited sectarian tensions which were abetted by the Protestant religious revivals of the Second Great Awakening. So this is obviously one of their themes to take over the North was division based off of religious faith, whereas the South was all based off of division uh, on other circumstances. But clearly the division was fueled by their forgeries of national documents, which that was the basis for uh, the enraged um, 
conflict. And then, of course, naturally, considering they uh, took over and survived afterwards, the followers of the Supreme Being, they twisted the narrative to something else. Also, we have the Philadelphia nativist riots, and you can find many of the other examples of these types of activities all over the place, although they don't like to make the connections for you. Philadelphia nativist riots, also known as the Philadelphia prayer riots, the Bible riots, and the Native American riots, mm -hmm. hmm. were a series of riots that took place on May 6th through 8th and July 6th through 7th, 1844, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the United States, and the adjacent districts of Kensington and Southwark. The riots were a result of rising anti-Catholic sentiment to the growing population of Irish Catholic immigrants. They love that talking point, don't they? The government brought in over a thousand militia. They confronted the nativist mobs and killed or wounded hundreds of anti-Catholic rioters. And that's a lie. In the five months leading to the riots, nativist groups had been spreading a false rumor that Catholics were trying to remove the Bible from public schools. A nativist rally in Kensington erupted in violence on May 6th and started a deadly riot that would result in the destruction of two Catholic churches and numerous other buildings. Riots erupted again in July after it was discovered at St. Philip Mary's Catholic Church. Blah, blah, blah. So that's their take on it. And then we looked at those documents that are clear forgeries, and those are more than likely the reason for such an uprising. And the use of the quote-unquote militia was not done like that, and it wouldn't have been done like that, making it sound like there's some sort of thug force that could be wielded like they can be today as far as the National Guard goes, pretending that they were, they are and were the militia. Now we come to this Wikipedia article, Voyageurs, for a different example, or uh, another example, I suppose you could say, of a different tactic that they use, especially when it comes to these Wikipedia articles and evidence of what I said before, which is that these were either written by students of professors and universities, not knowing that their work would then be lifted and put into uh, Wikipedia articles, or it was written by professors themselves, which are completely brain dead and doing this for the intended purposes of being the mouthpiece for their supreme being. Voyageurs were the 18th and 19th century French Canadians who transported furs by canoe at the peak of the North American fur trade. They transported a lot more than just fur. The emblematic meaning of the term applies to places in New France, including the Pays de Lot, or Pais de Lot, Pays de Lenoir, and times where that transportation was over long distances. The voyageurs' strength and endurance was regarded as legendary. They are celebrated folklore and music for reasons of promise, celebrity status, and wealth. This position was coveted. Now, I'm not going to go reading the rest of this article because it is a complete piece of garbage. In the references, number one from 2011, number two from 2010, number three from 1955, number four from 1992, number five from 2011, number six from 2015, number seven from 1992, number eight from 1992. Number nine does not have a date. But it's definitely not from time period. Number 10 is from 2004. Number 11 is from 1969. Number 12 is from 1995. Number 13 is from 2006. Number 14 is from 1941. Number 15 from 1969. Number 16 from 2006. And I'm sure you are seeing a pattern here. Number 7 is from 2006 or 17. Number 18 is from 1992. Number 19 is from 2006. Number 20 is from 2006. Number 21 is from uh, well, it doesn't have a date, but it's got an ISBN, so probably around the 2000s. Number 22 is 2006, number 23 is 2006, and it doesn't believe that they're referencing the same book in multiple. So 19 is Carolyn Podruchny making the Voyager World Travels and Traders in North America Fur Trade, Lincoln University of Nebraska Press. Number 22 is Carolyn Podruchny making the Voyager World Travelers and Traders in North America Fur Trade, Lincoln University of Nebraska Press. And number 23 is Carolyn Pedrushny making the Voyager World and, you guessed it, Travelers and Trades in North America Fur Trade, Lincoln University of Nebraska Press. Huh. 24, Engelbert Robert, Divergent Identities and Converging Interests, 2007. And it looks like that 25 is going to be a repeat of 24. 26 is from, allegedly anyway, 1810. That's the Library Art Archives Canada, Hudson Bay Company Archives, Governor and Committee General, Inward Correspondence, Call Robertson to London Committee. And then it looks like we got a repeat in 27 of both 25 and 24 from 2007. 
28 does not have a date. 29 is does not have a date. 30 has 2005. And 31 doesn't have a date. 32 is from 2006. 33 is from 2006. And they are replicating other the Carolyn Pedruchny one in both 32, 33, and 34. 35 is from 1992. So in their 35 references, not a single one comes even close to the period of time that they're talking about. It's all later commentary. And that book from 1810 is probably later commentary, but backdated. And, of course, they use a lot of references from current times and repeat references. Just like a student would be instructed to do in those ridiculous classes that we call education in the universities. So, this was definitely written by a student under the direction of a professor, and then published by that professor or some other uh, automaton mechanism person from that system and uploaded to Wikipedia. And none of it comes from the perspective of the time, nor anybody who actually has a uh, qualification as far as we understand that of merit, anyway. Uh, is not allowed to write on these. They would get edited out by the people that control this stuff. So here we find another forgery from recent times, and he, by H.P. Lovecraft, in which one line we will find really stands out. It states, I was faint, even fainter than that hateful modernity of that accursed city had made me. He, short story, according to Wikipedia, he is a short story by American horror writer H.P. Lovecraft, written August 1925, was first published in Weird Tales, September 1926. Allegedly, of course, this story is attributed to the name H.P. Lovecraft, who likely was not a singular and real individual, but rather an assumed name for multiple works made by different writers. And then, later, other works were attached to that name, like this disgusting fraud called he modernism and postmodernism history by history.com editors updated august 21st 2018 modernism in the arts refers to the rejection of the victorian era's traditions and the exploration of industrial age real life issues and combined the rejection of the past with experimentation sometimes for political purposes stretching from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century Modernism reached its peak in the 1960s. Postmodernism describes the period that followed during the 1960s and 1970s. Postmodernism is a dismissal of rigidity of modernism in favor of anything goes approach and subject matter process material. Yeah, sure. As far as I'm aware, as far as my experience goes, these terms I have only ever used in the spheres of universities and from a relatively recent time period from professors that would have been studying in the 1960s. That's the time period, not the so-called late 19th century. If you read books from that time period that you can authenticate as being real, they do not use these terms that are used today from our university system. Modernism and art. The shift to modernism can be partly credited to new freedoms enjoyed by artists in the late 1800s. Traditionally, a painter was commissioned by a patron to create a specific work the late 19th century witnessed many artists capable of seizing more time to pursue subjects of their personal interests, but they still would not have used the term modernity. The term modern was first used in the late 19th century to describe new and innovative developments of the time. Before this period, the era was often referred to as the contemporary or present period, reflecting the understanding that it was the current time. The term modernity first coined in the 1620s. Yeah, I'm sure they would have used the word coined at that time period, too. Now that we're playing the let's pretend game of rewrite history and don't use logic or understanding or reason or even question anything they say because we're all mindless automatons that just follow along with every ridiculous fraud and lie that is shoved down our throats. In a context assumed by the implication of a historical epoch following the Renaissance in which the achievements of antiquity were surpassed. Of course, I have had books attributed to my name which I never wrote 
like this disgusting piece of garbage called Spatterluck, assigned to my author profile on Amazon and many of the other websites and outlets that I have profiles on, and of course to Goodreads, which I did not create a profile on, but they assigned one to me anyway. And then also on Amazon, they listed my books on the Mexican website under Layla Stone, which is nowhere similar to S.C. Coleman. These are more examples per of my personal experience with these tactics of the followers of the Supreme Being and their mischievous frauds and tricks that they play in order to control things and obfuscate reality. Now, and another example from my life we found with the Free Ohio Now group. Originally in 2020, when there were protests going out in the capital of Columbus, Ohio against mask mandates and other things, there were large crowds of people that would gather at the state house in the capital. And I'm sure this was going on all across the country. However, on the outskirts of this group, were individuals handing out flyers that listed Free Ohio Now, obviously pretending to be the organizers of this rally or protest, whatever you want to call it. So I decided that I would volunteer with them. And when they set up a local event in our community, which I managed to pull together, my position was taken without my being informed of it as I went there and found that in fact somebody else had taken over the day of without telling me and was now running it. Also the turnout was very small and proved that these people were in fact not controlling the or the organizers of those protests at the state house. They were simply simply pretending to be. Also, they took the pretense of ma uh, managing it and orchestrating it and got all this press coverage of something that they clearly did not do and then navigated the uh, protests against tyranny and uh, mandates that were illegitimate and unlawful to opening up the school, which many people in the group did not care about, did not feel was something that would be conducive considering the villainy of the school system, and thus would drive a wedge and cause disorder and dysfunction among the protesters, many of which disliked and even hate the school system. So they um, successfully subverted the message against mask mandates and all of this other illegitimate and unlawful criminal activity from the organization, the followers of the Supreme Being. And they successfully diverted it while also driving a wedge between the people that were uh, involved. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please join my newly formed Discord. There are free books available at the links. Also, if you so desire, you may support my work at any of the options available, PayPal, Cash App, Buy Me Coffee, etc. And please check out all my other content.